Okay, beautiful, beautiful. Good morning. Welcome, everyone. I'm so happy to see you all here today. Um, if you are able to join with your camera on, I really appreciate that. It's lovely to see your faces. Um, but if you're not, I understand people are often juggling and it is Sunday morning. So maybe you're lucky enough to still be in bed. That would be really wonderful. Um, let's just begin with a moment of closing down the eyes and coming into quiet space. bringing your awareness to your breath and to your physical body. And just taking a couple of deep centering breaths. Let's take a moment to acknowledge the traditional custodians of the land on which we sit. For me, that is the Gadigal people of the Eora Nation. Acknowledging the great wisdom traditions of all First Nations people all over the world. Acknowledging that Australia always was and always will be Aboriginal country. Acknowledging the lineage of yogis and Ayurveda teachers that come before us, for me, particularly the Bhakti Yoga lineage. And acknowledging the lineages, the golden thread of any spiritual traditions that you may follow, the teachers and the teachings. And finally, acknowledging the wisdom keepers from our own personal culture and ancestry, whatever that may be. And for many of us these days, it's a mixed bag. Acknowledging those who have continued the lines of healing and wisdom and spirituality throughout our own culture, our own ancestry. And then gently opening your eyes. So thank you for joining me here this Sunday morning. I'm going to admit to you that I've had some tech problems. It's the first time I've run a webinar. I mean, obviously I've run lots of Zoom calls, but I've never run a, a webinar specifically, and it's a little bit different. And I didn't set the whole thing up properly. So a lot of the automated emails that were meant to go out didn't go out. Um, so although um, I had over 250 people register, um, we're a much smaller group than I had expected, but that's okay. I'm happy that you're all here and many people will be watching the recording. So if you're watching the recording, welcome to you as well. In fact, I was thinking about it this morning because I was pretty sure that I wouldn't have very many people on this call um, because of the uh, my stuff up with the technology. And I remembered a story that my teacher had told me that was a really beautiful story. And I'll share it with you this morning, because for those of you who teach or who are doing any kind of um, business endeavor or, you know, putting your work out into the world, I, I always find this a very reassuring story. So there's a teacher called Yogi Bhajan, who um, was the teacher that brought the Kundalini yoga movement to the West. So he actually, in his lifetime, established a movement that had um, communities all over the world, big ashrams, followings of literally um, certainly hundreds of thousands of people, like a very, very big lineage of yogic tradition um, throughout America and throughout the Western world. But of course, he started as just one man under the instruction of his guru to bring these teachings to the Western world. And he arrived in Los Angeles in the early 1960s to an audience that was not really very interested in yoga and certainly didn't know very much about the specific type of yoga that he was teaching. 
And what he actually did when he first arrived, he was living with some sponsors. So some kind people had kind of taken him in and were, you know, um, helping him get set up and find his way around. It was his first time in America, find his way around um, a very different culture and society. And um, he rented a like a gymnasium space in a local kind of like leisure center or like I guess what here would be like a PCYC, that type of thing. And, um, you know, had this huge hall and this huge space. And in India, he had been used to teaching to crowds of hundreds of people. Like if he put on an event or a gathering, hundreds of people would come. Um, and so he rented this big space, but of course, didn't really know how to market or promote himself in um, Los Angeles. And so he went to the very first seminar that he was hosting and nobody showed up. He was in on his own on the stage in the hall. And um, he, he writes about this in his memoirs, and it's very entertaining, but also very beautiful and touching. He says that he decided to teach the class anyway, because um, he realized that when you put the energy out there, then people will come and it creates that cycle of energy. So he taught the class to an empty room, literally an empty room. And at the end of the class, he came down off the stage and he walked out of the room and there was a security guard that had been standing at the door the whole time. His job it was, I guess, to be like a door minder. And as he walked out, the security guard said, thank you. That was really great. I enjoyed that. So, you know, even though he felt like he'd been teaching to nobody, he was actually teaching to one person. And who knows the ways in which that um, experience shaped or impacted that particular security guard's life on that particular day. I mean, it was certainly momentous in terms of, um, you know, what he then went on to build, like he built a legacy that's still alive today. So. I just always feel like um, even if only just one person shows up, if I have the opportunity to share these teachings, then um, it's my humble privilege to, to have that opportunity. And I'm very, very grateful to be able to do so. So our topic for this morning is Ayurveda. Um, I'm going to spend a little bit of time just kind of talking and explaining a little bit about Ayurveda. It's specifically for those of you who don't know much about it. So it's kind of a beginner's guide. Um, and then I'd love to open up for some questions at the end of our session. Um, there are three words that I'm going to be specifically sharing with you today. So I'll pop those in the chat now. Um, just so that you can, um, let me just make sure I'm sending those to everybody, just so that if you're not familiar with the Sanskrit, you can kind of follow along. Um, and so I don't know. There we go. Um, so let's start at the very beginning. Ayurveda is a discipline that's several thousands of years old. Some people say up to 40,000 years old, which is just a sort of a number that is so large to me, it becomes a bit abstract. Um, but certainly five, six, seven thousand years old in terms of the scriptures that we have access to. The main scripture um, that we uh, use as Ayurvedic teachers and practitioners is a script called Charaka Samhita. Um, and I often joke that I don't recommend that you rush out and buy a copy of the Charaka Samhita because um, it's a bit like an encyclopedia. It's very dense. There's a lot of information in it. It's in fact, not even one volume. It will take like, up like a whole shelf on your bookshelf. It's 10 volumes. Um, so my job today is to sort of whet your appetite and interest in Ayurveda. And then hopefully I'll recommend a couple of places that you can go to find out more and do more reading. But we, we were not going to start with Charaka Samhita. That's not um, our, our starting point. Um, Ayurveda has a very close link to um, yoga and sometimes is called the sister science of yoga. So the two sit very closely together, um, just like, you know, in traditional Chinese medicine, for example, there are different aspects. You've got the herbs and you've got acupuncture and you've got things like Tai Chi or Qigong or even yin yoga. So, too, in the Vedic system, we've got yoga, we've got Ayurveda. And then, of course, we've got other disciplines like Kirtan chanting, study of scripture, things like that, that all kind of fall under that umbrella. So Ayurveda is definitely very much in the same ballpark, under the same umbrella as the teachings of yoga. The word itself literally means a life lived in wisdom. So Veda is uh, wisdom and Aya is life. So Ayurveda means to live your life wisely, to live your life in wisdom. And it's the traditional or the indigenous um, healthcare model for India. So again, same as traditional Chinese medicine is for China, 
Ayurveda is the traditional system that's followed um, still today and has been for thousands of years in, in the Indian subcontinent. Um, the word Ayurveda is a Sanskrit word and Sanskrit is the ancient language of India. It's the language of all of the yogic scriptures and the language of um, the yogic, you know, the, when we hear the names of the postures, for example, if you go to a yoga class and the teacher's talking about Adho Svanasana for downward facing dog or Shashasana for headstand, then that's Sanskrit language. And Sanskrit is a very interesting language because it's not actually spoken anywhere in the world as a main language. It's not like anyone's mother tongue. Um, it's specifically a language of religion and spirituality. So anyone that speaks Sanskrit will also have another language that's their main everyday language. And then it's learned really as a sort of scholarly practice for people usually in India in the Brahmin caste, which is the caste that takes care of religion and temple and rituals and that type of thing. Um, it's a very beautiful language to learn and to study. I love Sanskrit and I've spent many years uh, studying the language. And there's so many things I could say about Sanskrit. I'm not gonna turn this into a, a talk about uh, Sanskrit language, but one thing I will say is this, my teacher, David Life, um, said to me once that the Sanskrit language is the language of poetry and philosophy, whereas the English language is the language of trade and commerce. And that really resonated for me. English is a very transactional language. We have a lot of vocabulary and a lot of ways of speaking that are very, um, uh, I'll give you this if you give me that kind of negotiation. Um, whereas Sanskrit doesn't have many of those words, but it does have a much, much richer vocabulary for talking about matters of the heart, matters of emotion, matters of spirituality. So for example, I'll give you a couple of examples. In the English language, we have one word, which is love. Sanskrit breaks that down into many different words that describe different types of love. You know, the love that you might have for, um, a beautiful sunset or the love that you might have for your dog or the love that you might have for your partner, all are different in their nuance. And Sanskrit has a different word for each of those types of love. Um, same with God. We have this one word God, which almost means something different to every person, I think. Uh, whereas in the Sanskrit language, it's a much broader repertoire of different types of ways of expressing divinity. Um, so to give you one example, one of the words in Sanskrit for God is Ishvara, and Ishvara means the God of your own choosing. So if you feel like you have a God that speaks to you that um, isn't in a traditional form, like your own sense of spirit, your own sense of source, your own sense of connection to the infinite or to the universe, then in Sanskrit, we call that Ishvara. And that, you know, there's a word for it. Isn't that beautiful? Like we're all kind of stuck in this pickle of having to try to explain, oh, well, I do believe in God, but it's not this God and I'm not quite sure. And you know, sometimes I feel it very strongly, sometimes not so much. And it can be very um, difficult to articulate. Whereas in Sanskrit, we're given this beautiful word, Ishvara, and it covers all of that. It's just God as you feel him, her, it to be in that moment. And, and, and the word Ishvara recognizes that um, our experience of God changes as we grow, as we evolve from moment to moment. I'll pop that word in the um in the chat for those of you who want to do a little bit more research on it it's one of my favorite sanskrit words okay so much of the teachings of ayurveda are found in the sanskrit language and today i'm going to share with you three different sanskrit words which i've already put um in the chat just to kind of give you a little bit of context now when we first start learning about ayurveda when we first start studying ayurveda the thing that most people jump to straight away is the doshas the constitutional types right we get very interested in vata pitta and kapha which are based on the different uh, elements and each one of us will have a mix of um, these elemental types within us and it explains a lot of the way that we show up in the world so for example my dominant dosha is pitta which is very fiery and so the way that I show up in the world is pretty forthright it's pretty direct you know I have a little bit of um, a struggle sometimes with patience there's a lot of fire in me right um, and uh, you know, but then, for example, my partner, who is very Kapha dominant, is very grounded and earthy and steady and calm. So we're a good balance together. 
Um, I'm actually not going to speak about the doshas very much at all today. I do have a quiz on my website, which you can go and do, and that will give you um, a lot of insight into what your dosha is, what your dominant dosha is. And then I'll, when you've done the quiz, you get sent an email that gives you lots of information about specifically what can be helpful for you to bring yourself back into balance. Um, but I feel personally that the doshas are not the right place to begin with Ayurveda. Because what happens when we get interested in the doshas very, very quickly is we then become interested in a set of rules and regulations that we need to follow in order to um, honor or bring back into balance our own particular constitutional type, right? And so the whole thing becomes very prescriptive. It becomes like, oh, you know, you're pitta, so you need to take a cold shower every morning, or you're um, kapha, so you need to make sure you get up early and um, have a big breakfast. And and so it, it it feels like a burden straight away. Almost immediately, you're 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 given a list of protocols and a list of things to do. And to be, you know. Completely frank with you, I feel like most of us in our lives at this time are already absolutely overloaded with lists of things to do, right? We're already feeling like, oh, I should be this, I should be doing that, I should be meditating, where's my green smoothie, I went to bed too late. You know, it's like a headache um, before we've even begun. And then if we practice Ayurveda in this very prescriptive way, um, it, it, it becomes even more of that. And I see this happen a lot. Many people come to my programs and my trainings, having done trainings in other places. And I'm not saying that those trainings aren't great and they don't have a lot of good content in them because they do. You know, I've studied in many different schools of Ayurveda and I've, I've learned so much over nearly 25 years of studying this work. But when it comes with a lot of rules and a lot of lists and a lot of regulations, what happens is we move into a masculine mode now I just want to qualify here that I'm not talking about men and women this isn't a gender conversation I'm talking about energetics right we each have within us the masculine and the feminine um, you might be familiar with the term uh, yin and yang the feminine is yin and the masculine is yang in yoga we have Sanskrit words that describe this Ida is the feminine and Pingala is the masculine and we're all of us, regardless of what the physical body, you know, um, is gendered uh, or our gender identity, we're all of us in this dance between the masculine and the feminine throughout our days, throughout our lives, um, you know, throughout our lived experience. And our culture right now, our current contemporary Western culture is very deeply entrenched in the masculine. So even if you're not in a male body or you don't identify as male we're very overridden with this sort of patriarchal culture and this culture that's very very masculine oriented which is all about getting stuff done productivity and uh outward experience outward projection of um image I guess you could say right so it's all about you know the whole of social media is very much in this mode like we show our perfect lives and our perfect children and our perfect sunset photographs and um we create this kind of mirage of um of a world that we live in which of course doesn't reflect the whole reality and this is all very much in that sort of linear way of thinking and presentation which then again is another burden of pressure that we put on ourselves okay so my interest and I think actually honestly I could say my life's work is to work in the mode of the feminine which allows a lot more spaciousness and a lot less uh, lists and protocols and uh, feelings of, uh, you know, stuff that we have to tick off, boxes that we have to tick off. Now, that's not to say that I'm not organized and I'm not focused and I'm not, I, I don't have a lot of that masculine energy in me because I certainly do. I'm, I'm very oriented around productivity and um, getting stuff done. And that's the pitta side of me, the fire again. But within all of that, I, I want to stay sane, right? I want to enjoy my life. I want to um, be wake up in the morning with a sense of lightness. And what I've noticed for myself and for many of the women that I work with is the life that we are living, the lives that we are living, our collective culture brings with it the burden of a lot of heaviness. Many of us feel very overwhelmed, very weighed down, and like we're failing, we feel like we're failing a lot of the time. 
you know I was having a conversation with my brother yesterday and we were talking about our parents and my brother was saying that my father who is elderly and lives close by him is being very demanding at the moment he's having to spend a lot of time going over there and looking after him and giving him a lot of attention and you know I feel bad because I'm in Australia they're in England so it's a it's a big burden on my brother because he's the only other sibling in our family and he said to me you know I just I, I wonder with this whole parents and parenting thing he, he said I, I feel like our parents generation got off really lightly like they didn't parent us with anything like as much anxiety as we have for our children which I think is absolutely true like my parents did a great job of parenting me but there wasn't the sort of helicopter investment in parenting that I feel pressure to to have with my children that I'm getting it all right you know um, and then he said, and they also have the benefit of us being really conscientious now as a generation in looking after them as elderly parents. So they sort of got the best of both worlds. and he was having a bit of a whinge. Um, and of course, you know, that's a complete um, generalization, but I feel like there are so many facets of our lives where we feel like we have to do it perfectly. We have to parent our children perfectly. We have to care for our elders perfectly. We have to do our spiritual practice perfectly. We have to show up at work you know productive and and um professional and together and it's just pressure 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 and at some point something has to give right and so what happens is so many of us experience mental health challenges experience if not mental health that's diagnosed at the very least overwhelm and feelings of just like it's all too much um and also experience burnout because we're on this hamster wheel trying to keep up with all of the things and trying to keep up with them, you know, in this very perfectionist type of a way. And then at some point we just hold our hands up and go, it's too much. I can't keep up. And so this burnout experience happens and we have to draw the curtains and spend, you know, a weekend in front of Netflix with a tub of ice cream because it's all just overwhelming, right? So what to do? For me, the practices of Ayurveda specifically even more I'll say than the practices of yoga and I've been a lifelong practitioner of yoga the practices of Ayurveda are the key that fit into that lock perfectly to unlocking a more moderated a more relaxed a more easeful a more forgiving way of being in the world remember it's a life lived in wisdom life lived in wisdom so these three pillars that I want to share with you today really um, clarify what a life lived in wisdom might look like. And I want to give you an interpretation that's particularly for uh, women and particularly for our modern time. The first one I've already spoken about actually quite a lot, which is Shakti. So Shakti is the divine feminine in action. Shakti is the divine feminine in action. And it's really what we've just spoken about, right? It's it's tapping into that side of us that just loosens the reins a little bit, that allows a few, uh, you know, um, balls to be like not juggled in the sky, like just lets a few things drop, that will prioritize moments of connection over moments of perfection. And this is something I've been thinking about a lot recently, moments of connection over moments of perfection right so so yes I can be I'm going to use parenting as an example I didn't really introduce myself in much detail but those of you who know me know I've got five children so the parenting example always is at the forefront for me the moments of connection are like you know okay my house is a mess right now and there's toys everywhere and um piles of laundry to be folded and my kids want me to read them a story right so I can choose the moment of perfection which is I know I'm too busy I'm going to fold the laundry and tidy up the toys or I can choose the moment of connection which is sure let's sit and read a story right and because of our um training in being controlling and be feeling order many of us will actually be compelled to the to the perfection we feel drawn to the, oh, my inbox is too full. I've got to clear these emails or, um, you know, my house isn't tidy or my food isn't healthy enough. I've got to like cook a complicated meal or whatever it might be. And what, for me, what Ayurveda does in the feminine mode, in the Shakti Prana mode, is it gives me permission to not choose the perfect thing, but to choose the thing that is going to be more, more relaxing for my nervous system and facilitate moments of connection. 
right? Moments of connection with even my community, like for, for example, now while I'm teaching, and I know many of you listening to this are yoga teachers, or you're teaching some kind of natural health or healing modalities. In my teaching, can I show up in connection rather than perfection? right? Can I show up authentically? And that word authentic, I think is a little bit overused these days, but can I show up as, you know, in the full embodied experience of what's going on for me and still share in a professional way and still share in a way that is appropriate to the audience, but without this feeling of a need for facade, right? The facade is very much the masculine. I always think of, um, Leonardo DiCaprio in that movie, uh, The Wolf of Wall Street, like it's the 80s, the suit, the Ferrari, the Rolex, like that's the masculine in its perfection of showing up in a way that sort of creates the smoke and mirrors that, that, that seems palatable to the world or even impressive, right? And even in our spiritual world, we have a, another version of that. Like there's other versions of showing up sort of in, in our perfection, but are we able to show up in our vulnerability? Are we able to show up in the truth of what's really going on for us? And one of the things I know um, I'm good at doing in the work I do is allowing myself to feel what's going on. And then in turn, not even through words, but just energetically, that gives permission for everyone else in the space to drop into the feeling function. So another aspect of Ayurveda practiced in the feminine as opposed to the masculine or the more traditional model is that in the feminine mode, we drop into feelings rather than the mind, which is um, the thinking. If you're interested in the Sanskrit of that, and I don't want to weigh you down with lots of terminology, but the Sanskrit for that is Manamaya Kosha is the mind, the mental realm. Vijnana Maya Kosha is the feeling function. And generally, again, our society, our patriarchal society prioritizes the Manamaya Kosha, the mind, the thinking, the logic. The invitation within this work of Ayurveda and within the work of the Shakti is to prioritize Vijnana Maya Kosha. How am I feeling? What's my heart telling me? What's my intuition telling me? And how can I cultivate the ability to trust that and to honor it? It's so it's so needed. So one of the great tools that will ena enable us to get in touch with our Shakti and to stay in touch with the divine feminine as we do this work of Ayurveda and we come to learn more about this ancient discipline is um, Bhakti. And Bhakti is the loving connection to whatever you want to call source the universe god divine we've already spoken about this idea of ishvara um, the god of your own understanding the goddess of your own understanding so through a connection to something greater than ourselves to spirit to source we are able to show up in the world in the authenticity of who we are in our shakti prana bhakti is the um, magical recipe. And I just want to read something to you um, that describes what bhakti is. This is actually something I wrote. So it's a little bit weird to read a quote from yourself. It's not because I'm an egomaniac, but it's just because whenever I try to articulate this, I never quite get it as, as, as well as these words I've written. So I'm just going to share these words with you because then I feel that I've done bhakti justice. Like I don't want to... Um, mis-explain bhakti because it's such a powerful and important concept so bhakti is loving devotion bhakti manifests as seeing the sacred in your home your child in all animals and in our earth we live bhakti through service to each other ultimate bhakti is between you and your god the surrender and grace of bhakti may be attained by all regardless of gender race or class I'm just going to read that one more time. You might just want to close down your eyes and just sit in a quiet space and absorb these words for a few moments. Bhakti is loving devotion. Bhakti manifests as seeing the sacred in your home, your child, in all animals and in our earth. We live bhakti through service to each other. Ultimate bhakti is between you and your God. The surrender and grace of bhakti may be attained by all, regardless of gender, race, or class. So 
So for me, Bhakti is the foundation of um, not only the work that I do, but really the way that I choose to live. Like it always comes back to Bhakti, back to that um, gentle conversation with source and that acknowledgement that um, I am not doing this alone. I don't have to make all the decisions and find my way through all the challenges without uh, support. There is an ultimate um, energetic presence that is available for me to tap into for the support for the guidance for the intuition for the um, empowerment that I that I need the final um, piece of this jigsaw puzzle that I want to share with you this morning is sadhana and sadhana means conscious spiritual practice so these are really the three pillars of Ayurveda as I see them and as I said I think it's really important that we understand and learn about these three pillars before we dive into the doshas before we dive into what our constitutional type is whether we're fiery or earthy or airy um, if we understand shakti bhakti and sadhana then we understand the foundation of what Ayurveda means and then we can become more subtle in our way of looking at the um, doshas and less prescriptive um so sadhana is conscious spiritual practice and very closely linked to the idea of mindfulness so you're probably more familiar with the word or the idea of mindfulness which is really very close to what sadhana describes so in sadhana it's really not about what we're doing it's about the way in which we're doing it i always like to give the example of drinking a cup of tea um, because we can drink a cup of tea in so many different ways. You know, you can grab a cup of tea at like um, a 7-Eleven uh, uh, and just quickly drink it down or, you know, like at a servo or something like that. Or you can um, have a quick cup of tea in the morning before you leave the house to go to work. Um, and and sometimes, I mean, I, this happens to me actually quite frequently. I drink a cup of tea and I don't actually have any memory of having drunk it. It's just like it happened whilst I was doing everything else. And then I look at my tea and it's empty and I'm like, oh, I... I drank that tea, but there were so many other things going on. I didn't actually register the experience of drinking the tea. Um, or we can drink a cup of tea with mindfulness and in a kind of ritual state, even with some sense of ceremony. You know, you might um, light a candle and um, sit in meditation or do some journaling, create a sacred moment for yourself in your home or in you know nature and you might drink some chai or some tea as part of that and really enjoy that experience and that's a completely different um, way of drinking a cup of tea that actually becomes sadhana that becomes a conscious spiritual practice and then I could even think about things like the Japanese tea ceremonies which are so exquisite and so elaborate and detailed in which the art of drinking a cup of tea becomes literally a ceremony that takes time and um, it has all kinds of different symbolism attached to it, very powerful and beautiful and elegant. Um, so all of these different ways that we can drink a cup of tea but we can become um, immersed in our sadhana practice by bringing mindful awareness to that very simple act and so it is with everything that we do in our lives you know the way that you um, fold your laundry the way that you wake up in the morning the way that you go to bed at night um, the way that you speak to others the way that you hold yourself as you move through the world um, the books that you choose to read, the movies that you choose to watch, the music that you choose to listen to, all of this is sadhana. And it's sadhana because of the way you approach it, not because of the content of the thing in itself, right? Even, and this sounds really crazy, but even me taking time to sit and play video games with my children, which is something I really don't enjoy and don't do very often, um, can become a sadhana if if my purpose is to be in connection with them and to step into their world for a few moments right because they're my because i'm invested in them as as human beings and i want to understand what's going on for them in the world as they navigate through as these young people video games for them are a really big part of that so as i step into that world and start to for a start see how addictive they are I mean that's one thing that's a whole other conversation but then also just see um their passion and their enjoyment and their love for it that is a sadhana practice even though the actual game is pretty toxic and the whole idea of gaming isn't so great 
the energy that I bring to it has a different quality, right? My teacher, Mother Maya, who is my main Ayurveda teacher, used to say that even junk food can be turned into prasadam. Prasadam means um, food that is blessed and will nourish you because of its blessings. It's usually, prasadam is usually food that's been offered to deities or offered in the temple. She, she used to say even junk food can be turned into prasadam with the right sadhana. Right. So you might be at the airport, for example, she used to travel a lot. So every so often she'd have to sort of eat something at the airport and, you know, have to eat something on the go. And it's not blessed. It's not holy food. It's not Ayurvedic food in inverted commas. But when we take the moment to just sit and to be grateful and to eat mindfully um, and to uh, hold in mind gratitude for the food that we have, then that becomes in itself a sadhana so we met I, I love the idea of sadhana in one way because we make the best of the situation we find ourselves in right sadhana is never about changing everything up so that we can have better conditions it's not about like get a new car get a new house get a new husband um get a new kitchen you know it, it's about work with what you have in the most graceful the most elegant the most appreciative the most engaged way that you can and then if you really find that there are aspects of your life that need to be changed of course change is possible change can happen but it happens in a way that's steady and mindful and um connected to our sense of shakti our sense of the divine feminine as it moves through us so those are the three pillars of Ayurveda that I wanted to share with you. There's just one other element that I wanted to mention today, which is the idea of micro habits. So one of the um, parts of the work I do that's very powerful that I notice has a lot of impact for the women I work with is um, practicing in ways that are incremental and slow and steady. And more and more in my main training, the Ayurveda goddess training that I run, I am encouraging women and working with women to work with micro habits. This idea of making small changes that you can incrementally build. Because when we try to suddenly change everything, we try to change our sleep patterns and our um, food, you know, our diet and fix our digestion. We try to change our skincare and our beauty regimes. We try to um, change our relationships. Again, overwhelm, overload. We might stay on the path for a few days or even a few weeks, but eventually we'll fall off the wagon because it's all too hard. When we work with small incremental micro changes, we start to create sustaining change. We start to see results and it becomes a, a cycle of empowerment rather than a cycle of failure and feeling like we're disempowered. So, um, I am going to be sending an invitation out to you um, after this webinar to invite you to join me in the Ayurveda Goddess training, which is my full training. Um, and I'm going to be offering all of you a discount. So don't jump off this call and then go and um, sign up straight away because you'll get an email this afternoon that will offer you a discount. Um, and what I want to say to you about that training is it really is a piece of work that I have created to make incremental, slow and steady change possible for you in your life. And I'm, you know, I, I wrote a blog post recently talking about the fact that I've stopped using the word busy or I've tried to really cull the word busy out of my vocabulary because I find it very unhelpful. People say, how are you? And I'm like, I'm always busy. I'm always going to be busy. Right. So I try to think of my life as being full and abundant and juicy rather than busy because it's all a choice so I've got as many things going on in my life as all of you have I can guarantee you M maybe more maybe some of you um you know have different types of responsibilities but we're all overloaded that's what I'm trying to say we've all got too much on our plates um and what I've made a a deep practice and something I've studied and and you know really applied in my life is this idea of the slow steady incremental change so that's how I teach Ayurveda that's what I want to share with you and that's I guess my promise to you really is that um it will be offered to you and shared with you if you decide to continue the journey of working with me in a way that will fit with your life and that will show results over time um and feel supported not feel like oh there's all these things I have to do and I'm failing and I'm judging myself and um it's all too hard so I wanted to 
say that quite clearly. And, um, you know, we go into the psychology of micro habits and building incrementally a lot more in the training and how that works and, and just how powerful, um, how powerful that can be as a, as a way of approaching this word, this work, I'm sorry. Um, I'm going to open up to questions. Um, but before I open up to questions, I also promised to do a giveaway. So I've got a copy of, and um, this is for the people joining us live. If you're on the recording, I'm afraid you miss out this time. This is a copy of my journal, Mindful Living, um, which has been produced by Rock Paul. It's hard for me to show you, but they did an amazing job of the production. It's really, really um, beautifully formatted and created. So I'm going to send this out to someone and I'm just going to literally... I'm actually going to close my eyes and scroll through the list of people who are here and land on Jody. Um, Jody, there you are. So you'll get that's a copy of that's coming to you. Um, can I ask you to just private message me in the chat, just me, so you don't have to share your address with everyone and just put your address in the chat so that I can send you that. And then this one, I'll get you to put your hand up for because this won't be relevant for everyone. This is my other book, Yoga of Birth. So is anyone pregnant or does anyone have a pregnant friend who would really benefit from this book? Yes, Claire. Okay, brilliant. So Claire, pop your um, either your name and address or your friend's name and address in the chat privately to me, and I will send a copy of that out. Anyone else? I've got a few of these. Anyone else pregnant or um, Marianne? Yep, do the same. And anyone else for yoga of birth, I've got a, I've got three or four copies of this. So um, I'm happy to mail that out to, as a gift to a pregnant person who would benefit from it. Um, Zoom user, I can see you've got your hand up. So I'm sorry, I don't have your name, but you can also feel free to pop your details into the chat. You can just direct message me with those. All right, let's open up to questions. Does anyone have something they would like to share, to ask? Um, any insights that you've had in the last 45 minutes of me sharing this work with you or anything that's come up for you that you'd like to ask. Feel free to unmute yourself and just to speak. That's totally fine. Or if you um, aren't able to do that, you can just pop it in the chat. Hi, Katie, it's Jodie. Hi, Jodie. Um, I find it really difficult to, I suppose, continue practice or continue finding time for myself because I'm a giver and yeah, a mum, I do everything for everyone else. Um, is there like, um, I suppose meditation or guided meditation for morning and afternoon so I can actually schedule something for myself and until I can get into the habit of doing it, um, have some sort of support? Yeah, great question. There's a couple of things I'll say to that. First of all, well, there's there's three things. First of all, the overgiving. This is just something that so many of us suffer from. So um, you're certainly not alone with that. Um, and I think putting healthy boundaries into place is something I talk about and teach a lot in my work. So that's one element. In terms of the meditation or the practices, you said in the morning or in the afternoon, what I find a lot of women do is set a specific time for themselves. And then if they miss it, feel bad because they've missed it. So the first piece of advice I would give is don't have a particular time. And this is this is often counterintuitive. This is different to what a lot of people will give you as advice. You know, get up in the morning and do it first thing or always do it after lunch. No, because then when life gets in the way, you've failed. Instead, find your moments, grasp your moments when they become available to you. It takes all the pressure off. So when you find yourself sitting in a traffic jam, when you find yourself standing in line at the supermarket, when you find yourself, um, oh, I was meditating the other day while my kids were in swimming lessons and I was sitting at the side of the swimming pool, whatever it might be, those little moments that happen, grab those moments and use them for your practice, right? And I, I, what I recommend you do is develop something called trusted practices, right? Trusted practices are two or three practices that you know work for you and everyone's different, so they won't be the same for everyone, that you can put draw on in any given moment when you find one of those opportunities. So for me, my trusted practice is a mantra meditation. They are using essential oils. So I've always got oils around. I'll grab an oil, I'll put a couple of drops on, I'll take a few inhalations, I might drop a couple on my crown chakra. And that's like a beautiful reset for me that takes 90 seconds. 
Um, other trusted practices that I have are through the breath, long exhales. So I'll just, you know, if I find myself with a moment, two minutes, three minutes before a Zoom call starts on the toilet, I mean, you name it, pick a trusted practice and you've then you've done your sadhana. Then you're weaving it in through your day. It's not like, oh, it's 12 o'clock. I should be meditating for 10 minutes. But I actually also need to do these three other things. It's like, here I am in this moment. I've got a second. I'm going to utilize it. Thank you. That was a really good question, Jody. I can see other questions in the chat and I can also see that my computer is um, plugged in for charge, but not that, but the power cord isn't plugged in. So it's, I'm about to run out of battery. So please bear with me just 10 seconds while I plug my um, laptop in, otherwise you'll lose me. Okay, beautiful. I'm back. Um, and I'm not going to disappear due to no power. Um, okay, I'm just having a quick look through the chat. Okay, so I've got all of those books that I'll make sure they all get posted out. Thank you. Sarah was asking an example of a micro habit. I think that probably got covered somewhat in um, the previous question, just this idea of finding an incremental moment in the day. And then, and then of course, you can build on that, right? So two minutes can become three minutes can become 10 minutes. Um, I remember once I asked my teacher, David Life, what's the most difficult yoga asana, physical yoga practice that you do? What's the hardest thing? And he has a very advanced practice. And he said, the most difficult thing every time is just getting on the mat and starting, right? This is a guy that can balance on one arm, you know, like the hardest part is just beginning. And so he said, you know, once I'm on the mat, once I'm doing it, 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 it flows, it becomes easy. And often I, th I think I was going to do a 10 minute practice, but it ends up being an hour, right? The hardest part is starting. I'm working on a new book at the moment. I'm writing at the moment. And every single day when I sit down to write, the hardest part is the first sentence, just the starting, just getting into it. And then sometimes I write for 10 minutes. Sometimes I write for an hour, a couple of hours, but always it's the beginning that's hardest. So this idea of the micro habit, and this is relevant to Ayurveda because Ayurveda gives us lots of things to do, right? Lots of protocols, lots of ideas of ways that we can manage our life and our health better. But the idea of the micro habit is we start with the low hanging fruit. We start in the easiest place. We start with the stuff we enjoy. I love essential oils. They make me super happy. I enjoy it, right? I don't, I'm not going to start with something that I find really hard, that's difficult, that feels like um, an arduous task. And so we take the smallest, easiest micro habit that we can, and then we build on that. And we do a little bit more, and we do it a little bit more frequently. Um, and you know what? The funny thing is, um, within spiritual practice, within yoga and within Ayurveda, we actually get so much more benefit from doing something little and often than we do from doing a longer period of time less frequently like if you're trying to build up a physical yoga asana practice I promise you there will be more benefit in 10 minutes a day than there will be in an hour twice a week so it actually works for our bodies anyway and our minds because what happens is the neuro pathways start to um you know, your neurology starts to build pathways that actually get used to doing this thing. Oh, I'm I'm training myself to extend my exhale so that my nervous system can relax. I'm training myself to chant mantra when I feel stressed. I'm training myself to use this tool, to use that tool over and over and over again. It creates new imprints. Um, in Sanskrit, we call it samskaras. In modern uh, understanding of how the brain work it has to do with our neuroplasticity and, and the neural pathways any other questions yeah Bridget's saying that she learned from herself if she puts too many rules she gets overwhelmed 
Yeah, it, it does depend on our personality types, right? For some people, there is a requirement for more discipline. So some people need to actually make a commitment and stick to it because there is a, um, a, a challenge with discipline. But most of the women in my programs and most of the women on this call, I could honestly, I just know it in my bones. We're not those people. We need less control, less discipline, right? We need to soften and let go a little bit. Uh, Marianne. Hi. Hi. Um, I just wanted to ask how in depth is the training next year? Um, like time wise? Yep. How does it how does it work? So mm. it runs um evergreen, meaning you can sign up and start at any time. Um, and I did that deliberately because I wanted it to be super flexible, right? I know that the women who are doing the training, and I've had over 300 women go through the training now. So it's really like, I've had a lot of experience of knowing what works and what doesn't work. And um, because we've all got so much going on, if there's specific sort of set times, a lot of people, it, again, it feels like, oh, it's this thing I have to show up for. It's a burden already before we've even begun. So it works in a very organic way that you just um, sign up and you begin. And then we have regular calls. We have monthly calls at the moment. There's a series of webinars that are happening that are part of it. Um, if you miss them, of course, you can get the recording, but you can also, I hope, show up. And I also make the calls varied in terms of when they are, sometimes morning, sometimes evening, um, sometimes weekend, sometimes weekday, so that there's a mix and match of people being able to come and be available. Um, at the moment, I'm really focusing on this idea of the micro habit. So a lot of what I'm teaching is oriented around that. But then I'll have other themes like, you know, um, we might spend quite a bit of time um, one month on digestion and then spend quite a bit of time another month on hormones. So it sort of varies. Um, there is a certification. So if you want to get certified, then you need to do a number of quizzes. You need to complete a couple of assessments, listen to some specific um, like podcasts, read a couple of books, like there's material that you have to go through. The course itself is 80 hours. So you, you go at your own pace, you do it, you know, it's, it's lifetime access. You could take a year to do it. You could take the shortest is probably six to eight weeks. Yeah. I know people that have done it in that time, but that's like you're quite committed and you're kind of like, um, you know, showing up very regularly. Um, does that answer your question? Yeah, thank you. Because yeah. I've got ongoing commitments and I didn't want to overlap too much and not be able to do it. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Usually yeah. what I find very commonly is once people start, they keep going because they yeah. see the results. It's it's again, it's like I just exactly what I just said. It's getting started. And actually what I am doing at the moment is I'm in the process of having two other coaches come and start working with me. And we're doing um, one on one, just very brief one on one, reaching out and calls to make sure people do start. So if I see people signing up and then a few weeks go by and they haven't even logged in or started, we're reaching out and we're like, hey, how can we get you just getting on the mat, you know, so metaphorically speaking, and then. It, the work then really takes care of itself because you start to feel better. You know, the upward spiral starts rather than the feeling of like, I haven't even started. I get lots of emails from people saying I've signed up and I haven't started and I don't know what to do and I feel bad. And I'm just like, just log in, pick the first lecture that looks appealing to you, lie on your bed and listen to it. That's all you need to do. And then it, it, it incrementally starts to build on itself. Beautiful. Thank you. Thank you. Trudy is saying, I'm finding I've found physical hardness on myself is softening. Yeah, becoming more disciplined in my thinking in a positive way. Oh, and Trudy, you're in Ayurveda Goddess. Yes, of course. Yeah, beautiful. Yeah, it's it's such a funny thing, this dance between discipline and self-love. And it's something I'm I'm still exploring. I'm still exploring that. But um, I feel like when we nail that dance, the dance between discipline and self-love, we're really, really going to make progress on our spiritual path. We're really going to accelerate our um, connection to source and the bhakti that we experience in our lives. Let's take one last question. Has anyone got a final juicy question for us? Anything you'd like to ask or to share? Patricia. Uh, not a question. Um, 
done, Katie, but just uh, deep gratitude and thanks for your energy this morning. I, I really came in expecting to hear about how to magically change my diet so I no longer have digestive problems. And this is so much more um, than I expected. And I'm, I'm glad this is how it started. And, yeah, beautiful. Thank you, Patricia. And you know what? The thing is, you will fix your digestive problems through this work. Mm. It's it's um, it's so amazing. I, I've been blessed with really strong digestion my whole life. I've never because I'm pitta constitution. So we've got a lot of fire. We burn through and assimilate and metabolize very easily. So I've had other health challenges, but digestive stuff hasn't been one of them. And then after I had my most recent child, my my little baby girl, I had terrible um constipation and digestive issues for the first time in my life ever mm -hmm. and it was very interesting to me at 44 to suddenly have digestive problems I was like wow this is like and it gave me a new empathy for people that do have digestive problems and I went about very diligently following a few very simple Ayurvedic protocols that are in my Ayurveda goddess training I was like okay I'm I'm my own guinea pig right <laughs> Um, and I've done these protocols. One of my sons has really bad constipation. So I've done it with him and it's been incredible. And I talk about that in the training. Like he was four when I started. He's six now and his constipation is completely resolved through Ayurveda. It's just so, in fact, one of the things I really want to do on my list of a million things to do is to create a free training about how I fixed his constipation because so many very young children have constipation and it's so debilitating and Ayurveda just has some amazing, amazing resources and support for that. Anyway, so I put myself on that reg yeah. regimen and um, within uh, a week, two weeks, my partner was teasing me. He's like, I really just want you to stop telling me about your poos because I was just like so excited. I was like, it just, it works. It's amazing. Like, you know, and it's not just herbs. It's to do with um, different movements that you can do in your body to get your digestion moving better diet time of day that you're eating like it's a whole um range of different approaches like you're coming at it from lots of different angles but um fixed you know like no more constipation so I don't I don't need to report my bowel movements to my partner anymore much to his great relief um so yeah you you it's all in there it but it's so much of it is how we approach it you know it's that gentle kind inquisitive curious approach rather than oh, my digestion's a mess. I've got to do something about this. I know it's going to be annoying. I know it's going to be a restrictive diet, you know, kind of like feeling already um, like it's difficult before we've even begun. And to be honest, a lot of Ayurvedic practitioners, a lot of Ayurvedic teachers make that worse because they will just give you a list of things that you can and can't eat and a bunch of herbs to take. And you kind of leave going, this feels hard. You know, and my my intention, my work is all about this feels easeful. This feels exciting. Mm. Thank you, Patricia. Yeah, thank you. All right, let's just take a few moments to um, be in quiet and be in stillness before we leave. Thank you so much for being here in this space with me today. And thank you for those of you listening to the recording, which I know will be many of you due to the fact that I didn't send out the link to everybody. It's always perfect. It's always exactly how it's meant to be. If you are listening to the recording, just know that that's in perfect alignment. Wishing you all a beautiful Sunday. It's a beautiful sunny day here in Sydney. I'm going to go and head to the beach soon. Loka, Samasta, Suki no Bhavantu. May all beings everywhere be happy and free. May the thoughts, the words, and the actions of my own life contribute in some way to that happiness and to that freedom for all. Namaste. Thank you so much, everyone. Have a beautiful day. Thank you.